So last week I was in Kyoto having a quiet stroll through the entertainment district of Gion. A stunning area where it's not uncommon to see kimono clad geisha in their striking white makeup wandering up and down the streets. There's an authenticity to Gion, particularly on the south side with its alleyways and wooden townhouses, a sense that it's remained unchanged for centuries, a rare thing for a Japanese city. That's why I love it. So imagine my horror when a few days after I left Kyoto, the city announced that it was taking the radical step to ban foreign tourists outright from the very place that I'd just been stumbling around. My initial thoughts were, my God, what did I do wrong? What did I do? Not again. But fortunately, turns out it was nothing I did, although the blame does indeed reside with foreign tourists. More specifically, foreign tourists treating geisha like costume characters in a theme park, getting up close, firing off selfies, touching their kimonos, and even, in some of the worst cases, pulling on their hair. I mean, things were already pretty bad, with signs plastered up the street reminding tourists of the 10,000 yen fine for taking photos without permission. But clearly that wasn't enough, leading to this very sad move that I think most people would kind of agree is completely understandable. Honestly, I think the solution is actually fairly simple. Dress up members of the Yakuza as geisha mm. and have them walk around Gion in circles, waiting for unsuspecting tourists to pull on their hair. God forbid, that would certainly lead to some interesting results. <laughs> But today I want to talk about this and some pretty worrying stories involving foreign tourists because this isn't just a Kyoto problem. There's stories up and down Japan that might shock and surprise you. And it certainly doesn't help that there's been some highly publicised incidents involving foreign influencers doing unspeakably shitty things as well. But I'd like to think nobody here who watches these videos would ever grab a geisha's kimono or defile a sacred temple. I don't want to sit here and give you a stern, condescending lecture. I don't want it to feel like you've been summoned to the school principal's office for bad behavior. Or maybe I do, maybe I want to come there with power. You know, it's funny when I chat to people about coming to Japan, there's so much fear, fear about making a faux pas or screwing up the etiquette because Japan does have a lot of rules and things that we're not accustomed to while you're here. But look, here's the thing, you really don't need to worry about putting a foot wrong here. Perhaps with the exception of not taking off your shoes and trampling all over a tatami mat floor. In which case you quite literally have to worry about putting a foot wrong. Apart from that, nobody here will ever get mad at you for making a simple, honest mistake. The sort of things you do need to worry about are all common sense things to avoid doing as a decent human being. Case in point, don't carve your fucking name into the bamboo trees of Kyoto's Arashiyama forest, as has happened with over a hundred trees, often damaging them irreparably to the point that they have to be chopped down. Worse still, there's recently been some highly publicised cases of foreign tourists carving their names into temples and shrines. Just last year, a Canadian teenager admitted to scratching his name into the 1200-year-old Toshodaiji Temple in Nara, treating the UNESCO World Heritage Site as if it were a fucking whiteboard, using his fingernail to carve his name Julian into the wood. Defiling a culture, shocking, shocking behavior from a Canadian. You know, you never see behavior like that from a British person. <sighs> But if you graffiti a national treasure in Japan, you could go to prison for five years or get a fine of about 300,000 yen, $2,000. Fortunately though, if you feel like defacing a world heritage site or being an all around prick, there is a hack for getting around it. At the same time Julian was scratching the letter J into a Japanese temple, 6,000 miles away in Rome, Ivan was carving his and his girlfriend's name into the Roman Colosseum. Ivan plus Haley 23. Sounds like a fraught political campaign. Unsurprisingly, people weren't happy about this. But luckily, Ivan seemed to get out of it after he wrote a spectacular letter to the mayor of Rome containing what might be the best sentence ever written. It is with deep embarrassment that only after what regrettably happened did I learn of the antiquity of the monument. The antiquity of the monument. Yes, that's right, Ivan claimed that only after he'd finished scratching his name into a 2,000 year old brick, only then did he realise that the Roman Colosseum might be of some historic importance. I mean, of course it's a monument of fucking antiquity, it's in Gladiator for God's sake. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? I'll admit I've never understood the thrill of carving one's name into a piece of wood. So, let's do it right here right now. Oh, and it wasn't the only temple that got defiled either. Just down the road, another ancient temple was the subject of graffiti by what can only be described as a shitty Banksy, this time in the form of a cat. My god, what the hell were they thinking? Yes, I understand now. 
<laughs> the immeasurable sense of power, the self-worth. You tried to carve your name into the comment section, be immortalized forever. No, actually, it's very stupid. Fuck it. God, I hate myself. But look, I think for every Japanese temple or bamboo tree that gets defiled, Natsuki should be allowed to carve his name into a historic relic or item from the offending nation. Go fuck yourself. Only then will justice truly be served. Now, some problems caused by foreign tourists are a bit less obvious and a bit more well-meaning. Case in point, recently one of Japan's most famous shrines, Itsukishima, was completely renovated down in Hiroshima. Partly because it was old and decaying, and partly because tourists were shoving coins into the shrine itself for what they believed to be was good fortune, inadvertently damaging the shrine with ever larger cracks and turning it into some sort of massive crumbling Shinto piggy bank. Still, hopefully the hundreds of coins they were able to extract from the shrine could go towards its multi-million dollar renovation. I mean, when they finished pulling all those coins out of the shrine, there must have been, you know, 10, 20 dollars. Yeah. But it's not uncommon to see news stories pop up about bad behavior from foreign tourists. And one of the most bizarre posts that went viral on Twitter involved this sign in a convenience store emblazoned on the front of the steamed pork bun counter. A quick bit of essential Japanese knowledge, the word kore means this, right? And when you order on a menu or a shop, you might point and go, ah, oh, kore shitotsu, onagashimasu. One of those, please, or, you know, kore wa pen desu. This is a pen. And so it's not uncommon to point at a steamed pork bun and go, ah, oh, kore shitotsu, onagashimasu. Yet this note reads, to foreign customers, don't say this one and point. Say, steamed bun, please. Now there's two things I love about this. Number one, there's a drawing of what's presumably supposed to be a finger. And it looks anything like an actual finger. That's not what you want to see drawn on the front of the steamed pork bun counter. Awful. And the second thing I love is that the sign is written in Japanese kanji characters while being aimed at foreign customers who probably aren't able to read it in the first place. Because, you know, odds are if you can speak Japanese, you probably will say, Mikuman onagaishimasu. Steamed pork bun, please. Clearly, somebody working at the convenience store mm. has had a traumatic encounter and desperately, desperately needs to learn how to draw a finger. Meanwhile, in Hokkaido, the local government was criticized after making a booklet aimed at Chinese tourists that was labeled as condescending and offensive, with this incredible, fantastic drawing of a crying toilet covered in filth. Seriously, is there anything more worrying than a sentient toilet who's so technologically advanced its mood is determined by the state of its cleanliness? A frightening image of things to come. Toilets and pork buns aside, bad behaviour of foreign tourists does have real-world implications. A few years ago, one of my favourite temples down in Fukuoka, the uh, Nanzuin Temple, home to one of the world's largest reclining Buddhas, took the drastic step of turning away groups of non-Japanese tourists after a bunch of raging dickheads splashed about in a sacred waterfall and climbed on the roof of the temple. The Nanzoin Temple is genuinely one of the most incredible temples that I've ever been to. And the idea of people turning up and disrespecting the temple by treating it like some kind of fucking bouncy castle is genuinely horrific. But again, their exasperation is completely understandable. Like you understand why they're taking these measures. So what's the future look like for Japan in the face of mass tourism? It's important to remember that mass tourism is a relatively new concept here. As recently as 20 years ago, they had an average of about 5 to 6 million overseas tourists every year. This year, it's predicted to be 33 million. Japan has done such a good job maintaining its traditions and customs, ones that often feel very much at odds with the modern world, and it's what makes the country so profoundly rewarding to explore. And there's no doubt unchecked mass tourism, the kind that the country wants, does run the risk of degrading that magic, particularly in cities like Kyoto. Like I remember filming a video at a sacred mountain temple called Hagoro in Yamagata. And at the time there was a lot of debate amongst the monks and the local practitioners at the idea of actually sharing it at all and encouraging tourists to visit and experience it. The moment you commercialize aspects of your culture like that is the moment you, know, you run the risk of degrading it. Fortunately in that case, they kind of struck the right balance by limiting the number of people who could do the tour and using the income they derived from it to help keep those traditions alive. And Kyoto has absolutely benefited from the same thing, opening its doors to all its sacred temples and shrines, mostly without incident, without any problems. With this band kicking off next month in April, I'll be sad next time I'm in Kyoto, um, knowing that one of my favourite areas to stroll around is now strictly off limits. And I sort of worry, where will it end? What other areas might get sort of shut down? Um, not just in Kyoto, but around Japan. But at the same time, if it helps preserve the city's identity, and more importantly, helps Geisha feel safe, from ill-mannered idiots, then yeah, it's absolutely for the best.
But what do you think, guys? Is banning Taurus a step too far or a necessary evil for preserving Kyoto? Let me know in the comments below. But for now, guys, as always, many thanks for watching. I'll see you right back here to do it again on Abroad Japan. As for me, now I've discovered the simple thrills of graffiti. I'm going to go and carve a donkey into the wall. Nobody can stop me. <laughs> I have no friends and I hate myself. Oh. <laughs>